and gentlemen, welcome to the first digital LAFO conference. Today, we have two incredible speakers. One of them is Isabelle Azoulay, the managing director of La Maison. And we have also Daniel Grossman, who is the founder and managing director of Caris Capital. Isabelle is going to share with us her experience, which was private banking, which led to the creation of one of the most exclusive investment club for ultra high net worth families. Isabel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Serge. So I'm happy to share with you my personal story. I'm one of the three founding partners of La Maison. That was created five years ago. And uh, La Maison is what uh, someone could call and what we think is the first and most successful uh, European P investment club for Ultra High. Um, it was created five years ago by Michel Sicurel. Uh, and we are three founding partners. So Marc Lévy also and myself. Um, I think it, it, it's... Uh, interesting to, to hear my story and how did it happen. I was a private banker uh, running the ultra high net worth individual department for Credit Suisse in France. Um, what we call at this moment uh, investment partners. The idea of this department was to bring solutions uh, and give access to the ultra high net worth uh, clients, uh, the access to the investment bank. So give them access to private placement, private debt, structured product, uh, pre-IPO deals, so they would be corner investors. Uh, I also gave them access to Montclair. Uh, when um, Eurasio came at the capital of Montclair uh, and took the stake from Carlisle, it was too big for them. So they were looking for a syndication and I helped them syndicate it uh, towards my private client. So I was already in the environment of uh, private placement, private equity, um, but still in the private banking department, so only with private clients. And one day, out of the blue, um, I'm in the evening listening to my voice message, and I find this voice message from Michel Sicurel saying, hello, uh, Isabel, I'll be very happy that you call me back. For you to know, Michel Sicurel, I didn't know him, but I know the name. Um, he was what we called, and he is still, uh, the banker. So if you look at the movie of Romy Schneider called The Banker and you take the same as a man, he, he is this representation. If you Google him, you'll find that he looks like James Bond. So, and he was a former uh, member of the government running the, the, the treasuries. Uh, and then he was the CEO for 15 years of Rothschild, La Compagnie Financière Rothschild, and brought the bank to the success um, it was. So when you receive this kind of call, you're like, is this, is this happening? So I called him back, saw him, and he um, told me uh, about his project, which was to build this uh, great uh, club because we're more a club than an investment vehicle. And his idea was to bring around him his friends and family, knowing that his best friends were the most successful European industry captain. Uh, the first one was Serge Dassault, um, the, the, the Dassault family running the aircraft, Dassault system. The second one was Michel David Vey, the third one, Carlo De Benedetti. So this was the three pillar uh, of the club and then he brought around him all his other friends like uh, Maurice Lévy from Publicis, Martin Bouygues in the telecom industry and I brought the youngest one because they were my clients more tech entrepreneurs like Xavier Niel, Jacques-Antoine Grandjean. Um, so around the table there's 15 families we structured to start um, holding Luxembourg uh, company that's an evergreen uh, investment vehicle and the idea was to start co-investing together um, the the idea was to bring to these families 
uh, deals they wouldn't naturally have access to, which was not easy when we started, because you can imagine this family all have structured family offices that bring them a lot of uh, investment solutions and ideas. So we, we had to bring value. And I would say uh, the first value that we brought was to bring them all together around the table. Uh, the thing that Michel and I said to this uh, great investors is more than your money, what we want is you. We want to have you around the table. You're gonna be the value. So we, we didn't give access, and I'm sorry, I know I'm talking to a family office audience, to the family officers, but only to the business owners. And this is how all the emulation started because they talk together, they sit at the board of each other, and they bring value on the sector. So in fact, we created an investment team. Um, and, and this was all about it. Uh, so it started five years ago with an investment vehicle, investing in multi-sector, multi-geography. So very soon with the investors and the people around the table, we decided to become tech investors and, and try to find tech investments for this show, this show or those. So we wanted to go in the um, places where tech was high. It was not easy to go in the valley at the moment because if you, you, even if you represent big families in France and Europe, you're no one in the valley. Um, China was hard to access to. So it all started with Israel where we had uh, access to all of this growth venture environment that is very, very active in Israel. So you know Israel is called the Startup Nation. Um, Michel in the past with Rothschild had already created an investment fund in Israel for Rothschild. He had access to a, a lot of uh, people there. I knew also the environment. So this is where it started. And we created this first um, investment platform in Israel, our first dedicated fund to tech um, environment called La Maison Israeli Tech Fund One. So this was the first real fund we created. Uh, and we started investing alongside to the local partners, the local venture growth partners that all became our friends. And what we had to bring, because you know you can not just knock at the door and say, hello, we want to invest with you. We're not going to put money in your fund, but please give us access to, 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 to investment. It was not that easy. So we had to bring value. What we brought was this huge round table with all this industry captain representing Europe because, you know, the Israeli tech industry, they are all very focused to the U.S. market, the Chinese market. But for them, the European market was so hard to access, so they just decided they would, it would not be a focus. So we uh, called ourselves as you know, this task that would help them get in the French and European market because once we enter in the capital of a company in Israel or somewhere else, what we give them is access to all the underlying companies owned by, by these business owners. Uh, so this is how it started. So the Israeli fund started three years and a half ago. We already did in this fund 26 investments. And then we continued with this experience. Uh, we had the chance to meet a great team in the Valley, which we partnered with, and we created a growth opportunity fund in the Valley. We did the same with a Chinese team called CAFE, which we convinced to do also an opportunity fund investing in 10 growth Chinese companies in China. Um, and very recently, we closed our second Israeli tech fund, uh, still investing uh, in, in Israel. We are the first investor from Europe in terms of a number of deals and amount uh, raised uh, in Israel. So we are very active. La Maison is a brand now in Israel, and we are very, very happy to, 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 do, to be in this environment. And very recently, we decided we uh, wanted to do this time, and this was Michel's initiative, 
to do a fund that would um, be uh, focused on the financial sector. Uh, and basically we are now uh, in the process of raising a fund in the tech for fin so and we brought two other partners this time uh, one is Didier Vallée who um, came from Société Générale and the other one is Jean-Bernard Matteux in the idea this time of creating exactly the same club but with these institutions we don't want to have LPs but we want to have institutions financial institution insurance institution around the table also at a very top level to stand at the investment committee in order to bring value to these companies that would be in the financial sectors uh, in the same way we did it for La Maison. So we're growing, but we wanna stay little. So we're only gonna stay a small team of 12 uh, people. And uh, this is the story. Um, I think really what's important to know is that uh, this path from private banking to PE was quite easy in fact um, it's not that we uh, one day decided or became investors first we we invested we started investing alongside to others so the funds were bringing us investments to invest with them but they were do, running the due diligence they were running the business case we were only doing due diligence on the due diligence and we learned um, and we structured a, a real team in, in all this time and today we're investors but still very happy to share the investments as um, the US person do it. Uh, I think it's, it, it's, the, it's super powerful to have this club of people. Uh, it's powerful when you have targets of companies because you appeal their, their attention with all the, these names and moreover, the companies they represent. And for us, it's super challenging to always bring uh, something that they would not naturally have access to and to bring value to, to help uh, them, you know, really apply their vision. And I can tell you the vision of their, these family is still incredible. Um, so they're all entrepreneurs. We are entre entrepreneurs. Uh, when you're a private banker, you only have access to entrepreneurs. So in fact, uh, it's all very natural. And it's uh, a great story uh, that I'm super happy to share with you. Well, uh, I would say it's not going to be easy. <laughs> um, Michel loves to say this world in French, uh, that is la maison is, is close. So it means, you know, maison close, it, it gives reference to something uh, you might uh, understand. Uh, but the holding company is evergreen and we didn't let any other person come in. What we did is through all the underlying funds, uh, families that could not get in the La Maison uh, were able to come and bring capital with a minimum of 5 million uh, euro. But we only let in uh, families that really want to bring value and create um, something around the club. Uh, so they're not directly in the holding company, but they can be LPs of the underlying funds only if they bring value. So it, it's a system of cooptation. The other families have to think those people or the company they represent will, will bring value and still also at the business owner level. And for the first time, this Tech for Fin uh, fund will be open to institutions and not families. Um, so the ticket is a, is a 10 million um, euro ticket. Uh, we already have three big institutions that decided that they would join this new club of institutions. And um, talking about families, um, we are going to do for sure another Israeli fund in the next two years. Um, we might do another one another in the Valley in the next year. So it's still very open, but in the idea of not being LPs, but being active.
Um, so it, it's a very interesting question. In fact, if we're going to talk first about the Israeli tech environment, I think they're forced. Of course, I'm not going to talk about the army that structures a lot of this uh, entrepreneur because uh, they have faced uh, very urgent matters. So they know how to manage a company. Uh, but moreover, I would say their power is their weakness because there's no Israeli market. Uh, so these tech companies, when they are founded, they are founded to be day one international. And I would say US. Uh, they don't have a, a market. So it gives them this natural international view. And this gives them a lot of power. If you talk about the valley, of course, they have all the natural environment, all this huge mega growth venture fund that uh, mentor them, help them. They have the market, the market, the US market is huge. Um, the valuation are still very high and there's a lot going around pulling them to, 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 to be the best, um, but super hard to access. So this is why we had to partner with a team that were ex people from Highland Capital uh, that knew it, it, it's, it's like in Israel, it's super hard to get in. If you get in, if you have access to, to companies, it means they're not good investments. All the people that went in the Valley and that had access to companies um, were not the good ones. The good ones, you have to fight for them and you have to bring something else than capital. So this, why we, this is why we partnered and this is why we really have to bring this club uh, towards the people. And in China, I would say it's even worse. Uh, you will never create, um, well, any story with the local actors. So you really have to partner and not in a, the idea of a partnership like we did in the Valley, but you have to, 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 to give your trust to other. And we shared this trust with the, this team from CAFE. And we decided in this uh, region in China to invest only in company that addressed the local market, which is huge in China. So we didn't want to invest in company that were international. We really wanted to invest in companies that would only focus on the local market, which is huge. So regarding the French market, I would say in the last five years, there was no French market, if you're talking about the tech. In the holding company, we invested in luxury brand like Isabelle Marron, that is not tech, because we thought, and it, it's changing, that there was no environment to help this French tech companies become unicorns. Uh, there's a lot of seed and um, early stage fund helping the companies to, to, to get uh, in the market. And then there's nothing to help them, to enable them uh, grow. So the good ones are bought by the American or the Chinese and the other ones, well, stay at a mid level or die. Uh, so this is why from five, starting five years ago, wanted to invest in the tech, we didn't naturally look at investments in France. It's now changing. The government has also raised an initiative called the, by, by someone called TB uh, to enable all this growth venture industry to start living. Uh, so they want uh, the industry to organize themselves and create investment team that will bring uh, capital at a growth level. So it's starting. So we are starting to look also in investments in France and in this uh, tech thing or fintech environment, we will look at French uh, companies, but it was not the case before. Yeah, so, well, we just faced a, uh, very interesting period. And uh, what I said to my last investment committee is that for the first time, the tech industry um, became a very resilient industry, uh, a very safe area to put placements, which was never the case. In the mind of people, 
tech was always a bubble, always overvalued. And I think with what happened with the COVID uh, and tech uh, enabled us to survive, to communicate, to buy food, uh, to, I mean, I think uh, Zoom became our best friend or day-to-day -day friend. Um, so I think really what has changed in this environment is the people the, the look of people in the tech industry. And I think this is great for what we're doing. Uh, but also, a lot of people don't understand the current valuation, the current price of the market. Of course, it's very, very pulled by the, the, the GAFAM. Um, but if you look at their results, um, they're, they have been growing and growing. Uh, a lot of unicorns now have the capacity to become profitable, which nobody thought it would happen. So uh, I would say this environment created a huge opportunity for the sector. And it's really, and we faced it, a very resilient uh, environment. If we talk about today, I'm not the kind of person who will tell you that. Uh, the sky has no limit. Uh, I think it does, but I think there's still a lot of uh, great thing to be done in the industry. If you look at the health tech industry, if you look at the food tech industry, um, there's still a lot to do. And I think this COVID period uh, will help change the mentalities and help uh, the tech sector continue to, to, to perform well. Thank you, Isabel. That was very insightful. Now, we have the pleasure to welcome Daniel Grossman. Daniel has built with his partner, Manuel Roumain, a very special investment model. They both came from two billionaire family offices, and Daniel is going to share his experience with us. Thank you, Daniel. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Lafou, for having me on your uh, digital midterm conference. I'll make this uh, first uh, Zoom presentation. Uh, I'll try to make it uh, as interactive as possible. I'll try to share with you perhaps more personal anecdotes about uh, who we are, what we do, a bit different maybe than a live uh, audience. I'll certainly miss uh, the interaction. I will hope you, uh, you'll enjoy and uh, you'll get some uh, interesting takeaways for um, the benefit of figuring out how perhaps to invest more in private equity nowadays as a family. Uh, my name is Daniel Grossman. I'm one of the two co-founders of uh, Caris Capital. Caris Capital has been set up about five years ago in 2015. Since inception, we have uh, invested, deployed about 450 million euros in eight transactions. Uh, Caris actually comes from the ancient Greek. It's basically been defined by Aristotle as the altruistic feeling of giving back. And we believe that this is at the heart of Caris. We actually believe that this is at the heart of every family, a way of giving back, a sense of giving back to society, to community. And both my partner and myself, and I'll tell you a bit more about us, have been deeply uh, involved in family investing for numerous years. And we fully embrace uh, those values amongst many other values that are quite specific to families when it comes uh, to investing. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Daniel. I'm 49 years old. I was born in Belgium and I have been active in the investment world for over 20 years. I actually started my life as a lawyer with Alan Overy uh, in intellectual property. I was then involved in um, a lot of M&A transactions, but from an IP, IT point of view, and I found it much more interesting to be actively involved in the investment landscape. So I changed careers, and since then I've been actively involved in private equity. For a large part of my uh, career, about eight years prior to setting up Caris, 
I work for a very well-established, uh, well-known Belgium family that is one of the main families behind uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev, the largest beer company in the world that has actually a, still a very strong family ownership spread between three historical Belgian family groups and three Brazilian uh, family groups. And actually one of those Belgian families had decided actually close to 20, 25 years ago in a very, I would say, pioneering approach to set up a dedicated vehicle to invest in uh, privately or to make direct investments. Not in funds, directly investing in companies. That was probably quite uh, avant-gardist at, at that point in time. I had the chance for many years to lead uh, the effort of uh, developing uh, that investment vehicle and uh, basically open up the doors to investing uh, through an office in Singapore throughout Asia and actually open up uh, the US door to uh, make investments in the US market. My partner, Manuel Romain, has a, a similar investing background. For about 10 years, he was uh, working at Goldman Sachs and then moved to head the investments for the Safra Foundation. The Safra Foundation is also, uh, to a certain extent, a, a single family uh, office, a single family foundation that has been established after uh, Edmond Safra had sold uh, his bank to HSBC for about 10 billion, um, I think it was in 1999. Um, and uh, to the same extent, Safra has been quite pioneering in uh, not just its investment approach, but also the way to then give back to the community because all the money that's actually made uh, through the investments at Safra Foundation are then basically giving back to the community amongst a couple of principles that had been defined by, by Edmond and Lady Safra when they set up the foundation. So coming back to that feeling of, of giving back uh, to society and also coming back to the family values when investing in companies to you know, share knowledge, um, have a longer, longer term mindset and be able to meaningfully contribute to the development of companies. It's with that background and looking at, I would say the changing dynamics in, in the private equity landscape that Manuel and I have decided to join forces and, and set up Caris, uh, we wanted to um, introduce that, that new model that basically allows families to invest directly in companies at a time where the market has been evolving to allow that. There's an increasing number of families that are looking to deploy capital directly. And there are an increasing number of entrepreneurs or family owners that have been looking for a different type of partner to help them accompany them for a stage of the future developments of their companies. And to that extent, um, Caris Capital is free of certain of the constraints that you know, we typically know uh, private equity uh, firms uh, encounter. There's typically the limitation in the amount that you can deploy per investment that is dictated by you know, rules, maximum 10, 15% of the total assets you manage. And there's also a time horizon that actually does not allow um, private equity to play its full role to assist companies in growing and developing over time. At Caris Capital, we actually do growth equity. So the fun part, we actually help company grow. We typically at Caris help company grow internationally. We help company go through their digital transformation and we help company leverage and push their brand assets. So it's a fun bit. It's, you know, it's not, lots of fun, lots of interaction, um, lots of creativity involved. Um, but often all those measures require time. It doesn't take, you know, five years to create or deploy a brand. It doesn't take five to seven years typically to just go international and be successful. It can happen in five years. It can happen in seven. It can happen in 10. With the model that we have set up at Caris that was inspired by uh, the families with whom, for whom we worked in the past, and that is common to a lot of families uh, in the day, we have the time. I often like to say we have the time to be impatient for a longer period of time, because at the end, it is private equity. It is investing. It is helping growing company uh, in a very active way, as I'll tell you in a second, about how we, how we operate. When setting up the, the, the model of, of, of Caris Capital, Besides benefiting from more structural flexibility, time horizon, as I mentioned, 
We also took great inspiration from some other groups with whom we had interacted in the past. And, and I think of, in particular, of two, two groups that we know quite well uh, with whom we have invested or with whom we have worked uh, over our careers, Manuel and myself. Uh, one is Rocket Internet. Rocket Internet, you know, that is basically very well known for having launched, established, grown a, a, a substantial number of technology startups. You know, I've had the chance to, to work, to invest alongside uh, some of those companies listed on the boards of some of the companies, some that have been quite successful, like Lazada, that we then sold to Alibaba, uh, like uh, uh, called the copycats of, of, of Zalando, in which we had also deployed some capital, especially in, in Southeast Asia, uh, like Zalora and other groups. And I had the chance to work with the Samuel Brothers and their ecosystem and to see the power of what I call an operational driven model, where you put all your resources, all your people, not just from an investing point of view, but also from an operating point of view, helping build companies. A, a very similar approach uh, has been adopted by other partners we know very well, uh, which are 3G. 3G or the founders of 3G are actually the, the, the Brazilian partners of the beer company. Uh, another bush in bed. So, you know, I had the chance to, 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 to work alongside them for a while. To a certain extent, actually, Manuel at Safra had a chance to, to, to have a good relationship with them as well. And it's very interesting as well how they put all their resources against, again, time after time behind companies to really deploy and create all the benefits of working as a team and getting all the resources supporting the companies. You know, first by investing in uh, Burger King, and I'll come back to Burger King because that's actually one of the transactions and one of the platforms that in the meantime we have developed at, uh, at Kais Capital, where again, you put all your brain power, all your manpower, all your energy for a time being behind a single product. I find that very inspiring. So when we created Kais, we actually adopted the same philosophy. We wanted to be free from some of those constraints that are not applicable to families. We wanted to have, nevertheless, the same discipline as private equity in, as I said, being impatient of having things achieved, basically moving, not sitting idle, make things happen. And we wanted also to be able to pull the resources of our team, of our networks, of our families behind the transactions in which we selectively invest to then unleash the full power of, of that combination. At Caris, you know, as, as uh, I, I I mentioned uh, already, you know, we are doing, we're backing typically consumer driven companies, we're building brands, we're developing uh, and growing companies domestically and internationally. In fact, we do manage what we call long term partnerships, you know, with a focus on growth and technology in innovation in consumer markets. We are, to that extent, very focused. We invest in consumer and consumer technologies. Those are areas in which we have been active for numerous years that we know well, in which we have developed uh, assets and capabilities. And we try to nurture those. We try to nurture and harness the power of prior experiences and build upon the relationships that we had built and developed in the past. So to that extent, you know, we, we, we have then defined that operating model that allows us then to work on a deal by deal basis with a select number of partners behind every single transaction. So typically, the way we operate is we do set up a dedicated SPV for a specific investment. In that SPV, we then invite, have the joy, have the benefit of having a few partners that work with us and that invest in those vehicles. Typically, it's behind, between four to eight partners in a single vehicle. We call it human partnerships. It's not a typical JPLP relationship. It's a relationship where you know, we, we act as owners and we have partners. Of course, there's a governance model that make it functioning. There's a governance model whereby Caris Capital JP, as our team, are in charge of the day-to-day -day, uh, operations of the business. What that completely means is we're in charge of making sure that the business plan and the investment thesis that we have defined is basically materializing you know, and implemented on a day-to-day -day basis. But from a governance point of view, there are a, 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 a quite some elements where we involve the families in a much more close way than they may be used when they invest, let's say, in, in, in a private equity fund. 
there's a couple of critical decisions that we take together at specific majorities. We do decide on exits together. We do decide on add-on opportunities together. Uh, we do decide on fundamental changes to strategy uh, together. All those things are typically elements of thoughts, possibilities, flexibilities that we have because we have the benefit of time and because we can remain very close to the business. It may well happen that there is an amazing opportunity to acquire a business after three, four years of holding a specific investment. If that is the right thing to do for the investment, if that is the right thing to do to grow the company, we have that option to do that with the families. And that then nurture a discussion. So that's, in fact, the, 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 the way uh, we, we, we operate. Um, so we build those partnerships. We have that participative governance model. As I said, we are very focused. We go, as I say, we go deep, not wide. We know our sectors of, of expertise. We know from experiences where we can help. And those are the areas in which we then look to help and grow and nurture companies. We act as owners. We act as entrepreneurs. We have a very uh, strong, as I mentioned, active operating model, which in essence means that we do work, of course, with, with teams. I have a great team that are already in the business or teams that we complement to existing teams or teams that we actually built because we have done greenfield investments, we have done full majority or control deals, and we have done substantial minority transactions. Um, we prefer actually the, 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 the full ownership or controlling stakes because again, it suits very, mal, very, very well our views, our capacity, our desire to be able to implement the changes, to be able to make things happen. But we're very comfortable in certain situations to be a strong minority because maybe the situation commands that in the first instance, maybe it's better to be a minority. That's the only option there is, but we can still play that active role. And that active role is played with, with very specific tools, a very specific set of, 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 of processes and ways to operate that, that, that we do. And I'll try to explain that maybe in a second through a life example. Um, we also, uh, as I mentioned, harness the power of our networks. We have this tendency of working often with partners we know well. I believe that in private equity in general, maybe in investing in general, people underestimate the value of networks, the, maybe not just the value of networks, the human dimension. You know, when you invest in a company, you're gonna collaborate with a wide variety of, of people for four, five, six, seven, eight years, partners, founders, co-investors, suppliers, teams. It's a human partnership, first and foremost. Of course, there's all the financial elements, but this human aspect, this um, human interaction, this collaboration is something that we nurture and cherish a lot. Um, so maybe to go a bit more concrete in some of the transactions we, we've done that, that may further illustrate a bit this philosophy of, of, of collaboration, of working. Um, I'll take this example of the quick service restaurant industry, the fast food market. As I mentioned, you know, we, we have an historical relationship with the 3G, one of the very first, if not the very first large private equity transaction uh, was acquiring the RBI restaurant brands internationally Initially, the Burger King brand, then with some add-on opportunities uh, like Popeyes and Tim Hortons that came and, and, and grew that group. Um, actually, Safra was also one of the founding investors in that uh, Burger King uh, relationship. I had a chance with Berlin Invest to also take master franchise for Burger King in a couple of markets, uh, India, Indonesia. So we knew the brand, the brand values, the partners extremely well from the inside. When they decided 3G, RBI, to deploy, to redeploy the mass of franchises in Europe, to find partners, to help them grow Burger King brands. We became a natural candidate to take mass of franchises in a few markets. So we took on the mass of franchise for Italy and Poland. And in the second instance, after uh, having acquired the quick brands, a year, a year and a half thereafter, uh, from the Group Bertrand, we also took the master franchise for Burger King in uh, Belgium and Luxembourg. And Luxembourg, sorry. 
which basically means that we started with an investment thesis around Burger King, but we had that vision that the European market, in our opinion, was underserved in providing a large scale or building a large scale platform dedicated to, to, to building and developing strong brands in that fast food market. We've seen similar initiatives and successful platforms in the US. We've seen some in Asia. In Europe, we felt there was a gap. This being said, we had that vision. Now to have a vision is great. Can you materialize it? We started with the single transaction of Burger King, which was pretty much a greenfield. We took over initially the Italian and the Polish market. We had to set up the teams. We had to define the marketing budgets. We had to uh, open and, and, and create the pipe for the first restaurants. And then we had that accelerating factor where suddenly we had the ability to acquire quick brands, the incumbent burger chain in Belgium and Luxembourg as part of our brand portfolio. We did that and we continue on the way to say, hey, can we do more? Is there a further way to build that platform? And a year or so thereafter, we acquired Otakos. Otakos is a leading French uh, digital native halal brand that we acquired. And there, contrary to the first Burger King deal that was Greenfield and Quick that was a 100% ownership deal, we bought about 60% initially of Otakos, working closely with the founders uh, for, for about a year, year and a half before basically acquiring the remaining 40% of the business. And a year thereafter, still tapping into a further opportunity, we acquired Nordsee. Nordsee being the largest German-based uh, fish fast food company. Again, a very strong brand, over 100 years of heritage that we acquired from the group, from the Müller Group, uh, in order to add to our platform. And all of these brand assets, you know, allowed us to create what we call today QSRP, the quick service of our platform, that to the benefit of our shareholders, offers, you know, a very different um, investment profile than owning and investing in the individual assets. We have diversification in terms of food offering, in terms of consumer habits, in terms of geographical uh, opportunities, and we have a growth vector. Today, QSRP is about 1,000 restaurants. We open organically about 100 restaurants uh, per year. It's about uh, 1 billion system-wide sales uh, business, and you know, it's a, a very resilient uh, business, of course, not during a COVID period, which we'll hope and believe is, is exceptional, but we already saw, for example, that after, you know, the end of the lockdown, you know, despite some fundamental changes that we believe will happen in that industry, um, especially on the technology front, and I touch a base about technology in a second, um, we believe our businesses that will continue, of course, to, to, to operate well, and where we continuously see further ways and further opportunities for us to grow. Um, so I thought based on QSRP, I'll touch base maybe now doing the bridge maybe with technology, because this is the other element that is at the heart of what we do, at the heart actually of our passion of basically fueling innovation, fueling creativity, and fundamentally, you know, changing the way traditional businesses operate. You know, of course, a few years ago, not so long ago, actually, technology investing or consumer technology investing was more about a vertical. Let's, let's build, you know, a dedicated e-commerce uh, website or let's, you know, invest in a, 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 a dedicated uh, marketplace. That definition is long past. Today, technology sits across any business. And it's not just about the technology solution that you implement. It's about the fundamental business model. When I want to hook back simply to the restaurant industry, it's the way you order, it's the way you collect, it's the way you pay, it's the way you deliver food. It, to a certain extent, actually the way you may even produce ingredients for food. So actually technology today is a much more uh, overarching element. We've had a chance at, 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 at Caris and prior to that to be significantly involved in a lot of technology investments. Um, and at Caris, we have uh, built a very strong leg in technology. We are a, 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 an investor in Valtech, which is actually one of the leading companies, used to be a listed company for many years on the, on the French A market that we took private uh, alongside partners 
uh, two years ago uh, in order to allow them to continue to consolidate the market. Again, something very close to what we do at Carries. We love platform plays. We love this flexibility that we have to allow companies to grow in their market organically and uh, through acquisitions. Valtech could be a very good example of that. We are constantly acquiring new expertise, new technology solution into this, this umbrella company that's actually globally today, uh, that is at the heart of the digital transformation of a lot of consumer companies. Valtech work with L'Oreal, Porsche, Audi, uh, LVMH, Rolex, helping, redefining, positioning themselves in this changing uh, market that is driven by technology innovation. Next to that, at Caris, we have also uh, then started to deploy capital in younger uh, companies, younger technology startups. First, because we want to provide exposure to our investors to those technology startups, but also we want, in fact, to build the pipe, the opportunity to be able to support those companies as they further grow and develop uh, throughout the years, throughout the investment rounds, to each time be in a position to deploy substantial amount of capital in companies. At Caris, you know, what we aim to deploy about 100 to 200 million equity per transaction. But the transaction can be a platform, will actually often be a platform, or will be the opportunity to invest alongside the growth of the companies and remain these very active, close investors that across the stage of a company can help grow. I believe this is the role that you can play when you're a family, when you have time, when you are fundamentally focused on building companies. It's the role that you have to play as an active investor. Of course, we need the skills, we need the teams, we need the capacity to do that. And for, for us, that means we need the focus. We need the focus, you cannot be good at everything. So you have to define, to select, to know where you get at, and to actually do more of the same to a certain extent. So I think that through those maybe two examples, quick service of our platform, the technology platforms of play that we build, try to highlight a bit how I believe that you know, we can position ourselves, us, families, differently to help and support the companies. So I think I'll, I'll probably pause here. Uh, I cannot take live questions, uh, but maybe from you know, the moderator, we'll have some questions to try to provide some more details. Anyway, I do hope that there are some interesting takeaways about how we can, as families, invest differently, how pragmatically over five years, we have found a way to create this innovative, maybe to a certain extent, avant-gardist collaborative investment model that will find an increasing role in the private equity landscape. Thank you very much and uh, wish you all the best. Wonderful, Daniel, many thanks. To all of you, thank you very much for following that first LAFO Digital Conference that will be followed by quarterly events in the future. Stay tuned. Thank you.